Okay. Well, we are we are going to go ahead and get started here uh, with who we have, what we have, and we understand that uh, uh, daylight savings in the spring is always a little bit harder for us to get around. I don't know. It is it is for me. It feels like eight thirty. <laughs> I feel it in my body. Um, but I was reminded of this scripture here in Psalm 31, verse 15, where the psalmist writes, My times are in your hands, O Lord. And even when our time jumps forward. So I was considering this idea of time and the time change. And don't, I, I was worried, but I was, I was, uh, relieved to see that the the stones on Stonehenge have been adjusted to meet the uh, the time change. Whew, thank goodness, both the Stonehenge in England and the one in Washington State. So everything has been adjusted, and we're we're back on the right time. Are we going to continue? I don't know. Are we going to continue with uh, time change, or has that been voted out for Oregon? I know it was. Uh, it was in question, and no, yeah. <laughs> we can, we can hope for we can hope for something, something. But uh, well, good morning, everyone. Good early morning. Pour uh, pour a, uh, an extra cup of coffee, or make your coffee or tea a little bit stronger than usual. Um, we are. I'm glad that you are here and thank you for being here. Let's go ahead and find our center here as we, uh, as we begin and I'll open up with a couple of words in prayer. Let's center down, friends. Loving God, our times are in your hands, as the psalmist wrote. In those times, we encounter many things. We encounter life in the raw, the life as it is. And yet, you are there, guiding, speaking, prompting, and opening the way of a life before us. Lord, we thank you that you have given us that gift of faith, the gift that leads to your life. Lord, as we have come here together uh, in celebration of uh, your life, in celebration of your life and one another, Lord, we ask for your guidance, your openness, and that our hearts and spirits would be in tune with yours. We pray and ask these things, Christ, in your name and by your spirit. Amen and amen.
Our scriptures this morning are from John 2, 1 through 11, and Psalms 34, 4 through 8. We will read the John chapter 2, verses first. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification each holding about 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. Then he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had, come, that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. 
the word of the Lord. Psalm 34. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant, so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Fred, for that reading of the scriptures. And thank you, uh, music team, for the music. And I think if you sang one more line of I Got a River of Life, we would have erupted into hand clapping. I felt it. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> I, don't, I was right there. I was. I was starting. It was starting with a with a with a snap, and then then I was hitting my leg. I was ready to go here, and then it stopped. So, <laughs> thank you, friends online. Good to see all of you, as well. Welcome to the meeting. We're continuing in our series of sensing the gospel. And this is, uh, the, the title of this sermon is after the, uh, uh, after the phrase taste and see there in the Psalms. And if you're anything like me, it, when it comes to the gospel story, the story piques uh, my curiosity in a number of ways. Uh, you know, kind of reading over this familiar story, I start to think about a few things, and the first of which is, uh, whose wedding was it? <laughs> John chapter 2, they went to a wedding. Who in Cana was celebrating while having Mary, the mother of Jesus, and who shall curiously remain unnamed in the Gospel of John? The Gospel of John never says Mary. It's always the mother of Jesus. Interesting. As well as having Jesus and his disciples present, Who's, who would have had that honor to have them? Secondly, I start thinking about what was the bridegroom's response to the chief steward when the chief steward told him that a large supply of good wine was now being served? Was the bridegroom shocked and dismayed or I like to kind of employ my imagination here. I like, I wonder if uh, the steward, he gave the steward maybe a wink, you know, and an elbow bump and a knowing nod, you know, about, yes, yes, of course, that's something that would happen, even though he didn't know. He just kind of rolled with it. Maybe, maybe. What do you think happened when the steward told the bridegroom? And then thirdly, everyone who has read, read this story over the past two millennia has wondered the same thing. And let's join in the tri this, this kind of age-old song in asking the question, what did the wine taste like? <laughs> we all wonder what that was like. I wonder what that would have tasted like. How would, have, how would the pro flavor profile have been described? for this wine that Jesus made from the water. We know from the scripture that it was referred to as good wine. It was good. And if you're anything like me, I very much would enjoy sipping a glass of this wine while nibbling on a few pieces of Tillamook cheese, which, by the way, has been ranked some of the world's best cheese, Tillamook. Uh, recently, that was in the Oregonian. 
So it's important for us to take some liberty and use our imagination a little when we're reading scripture. I'm using my imagination. Um, lest our connection to it becomes lost and impersonal when we read these stories. And yet our story is anything but impersonal, but it records the act of transformation, an act of transformation than tasting that which has been transformed, water into wine. To taste then, thinking about taste, what do we, what do we experience when we taste something? This morning when you tasted your breakfast or your coffee, or your tea that you're, that you're, that you're you know, tasting and, and bringing in. To taste is to take in, is to ingest, is to make something outside of you a part of you. And in one sense, it's a personal and even deeply intimate act to taste, to bring something and make it a part of who you are, something objective, something outside of you is now then inside of you. And as we heard from the psalmist, to taste is a way to describe our experience of God, to taste and see that the Lord is good. The psalmist uses this act of intimacy, of making something outside of you a part of you. That is like an experience of God. It's a divine experience. We've been exploring how we experience God through our senses and how, how do we take the psalmist's word for, take, for tasting the goodness of the Lord. I think it best to understand this lens through a kind of a poetic metaphor, in a poetic metaphorical way of our experience of, our, uh, of, our, of God in our life. And this story in particular invites us to consider tasting and bearing witness to the goodness of God. And the first thing that I wanted to kind of, for us to, uh, to consider as we, as we look at the story, the first is about timing. The story has a great sense of timing to it whenever you read over it. And secondly, is to consider the source of the gift. Those are two things that the story kind of brings to the fore that it wants us to, to consider deeply and to not just pass over quickly. A sense of timing and a sense of considering the source. Firstly, about the sense of timing. There is something to be said about how Jesus got the timing right for this miracle. He showed up at the right time. It was the right time, the right place, and in the midst of a cultural faux pas where the, the host ran out of wine for their, for their guests, it just so happened that the right person was there <laughs> when that faux pas happened. In the midst of resources running dry, the time had come for Jesus to perform, according to John, his first miracle when things didn't go right and things went wrong. There's a, the, there's a theological term for timeliness, for doing, thing at the, doing something at the right time in the right place. And it's a Greek word that maybe you've heard before. The word kairos, kairos. Webster's Dictionary defines this, this Greek term kairos in the following way. It's a time when conditions are right for the accomplishment of a crucial action, the opportune and decisive moment, kairos. That kairos had come for Jesus and his disciples, and his mother for that matter, at that wedding. That's when it all kind of came together. The timing had come together. The kairos had, had, had happened upon them and had come, unexpectedly even. In the story, the kairos had come when the wine ran out. Yet I see this itself as a revealing point about how God works in the world. How there's often a particular time when things move 
between heaven and earth. And even the prophets of the Hebrew Bible had a specific phrase for this kairos. They had a, they had a phrase for this, for this time. They referred to it as the day of the Lord. That was kairos. The time had come for heaven and earth to heaven and earth to meld into one. A specific time when it seems that heaven and earth become united and one is kairos. And it's oftentimes not that we intend for this, but we often experience God most powerfully when things run out, just like the story. <laughs> things ran out. Things didn't go as planned. It was kind of embarrassing. When resources run out, we can understand that. When people run out, when patience and waiting run out, when we are poor in spirit, we then oftentimes find ourselves opening ourselves in to God in ways that maybe when the resources are full and when the people are present and when everything is going fine, we don't open ourselves in that way. And yet within this brilliant, simple story, there is a message about Kairos. When the wine ran out, the Kairos of Christ arrived to fill in the gaps, to bring new wine. And that's usually when we are ready to taste and see God's goodness. That was about timing. It's a story about timing. Secondly, it's a story about considering the source of the gift. Uh, secondly, the story is about a good gift that only a few know where it came from. There's a minority of people that know where the gift came from. It says the servants and, of course, Christ himself and eventually the disciples, but it was kind of a secret work. Only a few people knew where it came from. They're not sure where it came from. <laughs> oh, well, it doesn't matter. Drink up, <laughs> you know. Let the celebration continue in a way. And yet this hidden way of working in the world is a signature of Jesus in the Gospels. We see this time and time again. And however, the gift of Jesus, that is the good wine, is itself imbued with eschatological meaning. It's imbued with meaning. Late commentator Gail O'Day writes the following about Jesus' gift of wine at the right time and not a lot of people knowing where the wine came from. She writes this, it says, in the Old Testament, an abundance of good wine, notice abundance, you know, the the wine jars that were filled to the brim. It was an overabundance. It was more than, than, than could be consumed or handled at that time. This abundance of good wine is an eschatological symbol, O'Day writes. An eschatological symbol, a sign of the joyous arrival of God's new age that had come and had broken onto the scene. We read of this in the book of Amos, we read of this also in the book of Joel. Amos writes this about this idea of new wine, an abundance of new wine being present in a messianic age. Amos 9 uh, reads, The time is surely coming, says the Lord, when the one who plows shall overtake the one who reaps, and the tre treader of grapes the one who sows the seed. And here it is, the mountains shall drip with sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. So there's this picture of an overabundance of, of good wine. He goes on to read, I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine. The book of Joel kind of hops on to this idea of an abundance of wine in chapter 3 when it reads, So you shall know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. 
In that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine. The hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Juna, Judah shall flow with water. So there's this prophetic engagement of Jesus' action and then what the prophets were saying about a messianic age, an eschatological age when God's new era was going to show up. It's a symbol. Jesus is acting and interpreting on a symbol of who he's saying he is. John wants his audience to consider the source of the abundance of good wine. Where did this wine come from? Consider the source. The minority of people knew it. Do we know it? How it points to messianic hope and fulfillment. Um, the story of Jesus and the miracle of the wine is a prompt for us to reflect on and consider what goodness has come into our lives. I think it's, it's first level, what goodness has come into our lives through our relationships, through our gifts, through what we have, what we recognize that we have. What goodness has come into our lives? And it's also for a time for us to consider the source of that goodness. The life of faith is also one that involves a sort of timing, a kairos, in a sense. When God moves and acts decisively upon each of us, it's important to recognize who is guiding this time. And we would like to think that it's the usual powers that move in our lives that are guiding this time, this kairos in our lives. Whether it's politics, whether it's the economy, whether it's our culture. Instead, the gospel shows that there is a day, a kairos, that comes with simply being near Jesus in faith. I like how this story kind of sets up these prompts of considering the sources of our, of our gifts. It sets up the, the consideration, the sources of our timing, of God's timing. And I want us to go into a time of open worship where I would like us to draw near in heart and mind to the Christ who is still able to turn water into wine so that we may taste and see that the Lord is still good and is among us. Heavenly Father, as we go into a time of open worship, may we consider not just the initial questions of the details in the story, but may we consider these, the deeper motions of your spirit that prompt us into a time to consider the goodness of gifts that we partake of in this life. The goodness of our relationships, our friendships, and our companionship in this life. May we also consider the timing in which, Lord, you have moved in our lives and how in the past this has been done and how you are moving still today in a way in which guides us to seek and find your own heart and your own presence. We ask, O oh Lord, for you to speak, that we may open our hearts and minds, that we may discern 
and see your loving and precious will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we go into a time of open worship, may we go ahead and um, be open to the present teacher. If you feel so moved to speak, uh, we have a microphone that can be passed around. Uh, if anyone feels so moved to speak online, uh, make sure that you're, that you're unmuted so that we may hear what you have to say in vocal ministry. Let us set her down, friends. <laughs> 